you know, my acres this last week. And one thing that blew my mind, I have one gentleman, um, he does, he does, uh, a low salt fertilizer, zinc, manganese, calcium, a little bit of mag, uh, sugar. I mean, he, he does it. And the difference in that radical root system. Oh, it's amazing, isn't it? It is unreal. <laughs> but with that being said, okay, I also know uh, you can. I can make a radical root look, root, root look very pretty, but if we get a hailstorm, my yield's going to be <laughs> not that good. Yeah, absolutely. You yeah. know, so, but what he's willing to do with that inferro program to see that radical root system, and then before even V1, we already have our nodals coming. Nice. You know, you, you just have that plant set up. It thinks in that band it's going to go. Yeah, absolutely. And that's absolutely. what it's trying to do because we are putting an environment to express the correct genotype we want to see. Absolutely, yeah. Which turns into that phenotype. Yeah, and uh, your biggest thing, I remember we had to measure this. I, I have a degree in breeding and genetics, and uh, we had to prove the stability of our of our genes. Okay. And this was the hardest thing, and we called it the G by E interaction. Okay. And it was your genetic by the environment. And in the end, you know, that's the stability of the phenotype that you're talking about. And But in any case, we have to always push for the best genetics, the best expression of that. And, you know, if that hail storm comes, the storm comes, we'll deal with that later. But we can't go into the season thinking we're going to get a hail storm or we'd be idiots yeah. to plant anyway, right? Yeah, exactly. So, exactly. yeah, it's good to maximize that, and it hedges our bets moving forward. Yeah, so... <laughs> Applying floss later season, I, I go to my mind. We talked about how bicarbonates are a problem, how calcium, overabundance of calcium. Okay, we can see problems there with floss release within the soil. Yeah, I see more quality, uh, more issues with uh, water quality than I do with soil quality most of the time. What are some ways to solve that? Or what, in your opinion, what would be effective ways to try to move the needle there? Because I think to myself, I mean, there's sometimes that pivot's going, I mean, we're putting on an inch 20, so that pivot's going on three times that week, four times that week. Oh, yeah, and you're not in the same environment. I I have the luxury of being able to travel all over the world and work with different crops and different farmers. Um, One of the places I spent a lot of time, I used to teach, was out in California. Okay. And out west, in in, and and I know Midwest guys don't want to hear about California. (laughs) Although, let me tell you, there's some corn yield records out of the Central Valley. I didn't believe it until I went out there. I was like, no way. And these guys, some of these guys are still uh, flood irrigating. So, okay. I mean, California's two different places, let me tell you. Okay. you. You're getting into the valley. You got some cool stuff going on out there. But anyway, uh, out there, and a lot of times we are dealing with higher value crops, um, and into Arizona, Yuma Valley, you know, we're not playing around. We'll put sulfuric acid or phosphoric acid tanks right there. Oh, wow. Okay. And treat this right into the irrigation, and we just blast the bicarbonate right out of the water before it's even going into your field. Okay. Um, I've actually, uh, I've, I've expressed this to Florida farmers. I've expressed this to Nebraska farmers, Kansas farmers. They tell me I'm crazy. This is like a West Coast thing. We've even seen organic farmers do it with these machines that they're called sulfur burners. Okay. So I can't add sulfuric acid to my system if I'm organic. No, no, no. I have to get sulfur flour, light it on fire, make my own sulfuric acid, and then I could do it. But that's a whole nother discussion here. Yep, yep. So that's, and I understand, in some of these row crops, the value of the crop does not justify the acid tank. Uh, In rural Nebraska, you do not have the infrastructure to even deliver acids around like this. So let's get away from it. Yep. Um, one of the things we have done in some places, uh, I'm an old acid fertilizer guy. Uh, some of my teachers, you know, they actually patented that stuff back okay. in the seventies and eighties. And, uh, we'll use a lot of nitrogen sources that are derived from acids. So, uh, we're using stuff like sulfuric and dissolving urea right into it, making different blends like that, using that as our starter material, trying to dissolve some of this right in the soil. Uh, trying to blast away some of that calcium that's locking up my phosphorus right in the furrows and in the side dresses and things like that. So that's very helpful. Uh, I think from a widespread, everybody can do it. Uh, We may not be able to control our irrigation water. 
you know, that's what, what 27,000 gallons. Yeah. And it's a lot of water, but you have absolutely no excuse not to focus on your spray tank. I'll tell you right now in this high bicarb water, uh, you are getting abs- maybe 10% efficacy out of glyphosate when you're mixing this right into the tank. You can very easily, and micronutrients aren't as bad as glyphosate, you know, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. it's known to bind, but you could very easily treat your tank. Uh, number one way to do it, we're adding citric or lactic acid right to the tank, yep. bringing that pH down into a six range, six and a half. Very easy to do in a spray tank. Um, another really good way that we've been doing it is with fulvic or humic acids, depending on what we're adding. Okay. So maybe we're acidifying with some of that urea salt that I was talking yeah. about. Yeah. Yeah. Because that's got a low pH or uh, like a lactic acid, uh, amino acid. We'll get an amino that's uh, broken down with a lactobacillus. So it's really high in lactic acid. Okay. Something like that can lower the pH. Uh, I like to use a urea phosphate. I use like a 51027 with a full trace package. That'll bring you down to that four range real quick. Okay. These are very strong acids. Um, when we're using different chemicals, a fulvic acid, per tip, per, it's not super acidic. Uh, some of the fulvic acids are actually neutral. Yeah. Um, but a fulvic acid is a chelate, uh, and it's much cleaner than a humic acid. I like humic, and if you can get away with humic, go for it because mm-hmm. it's, it's cheaper. Uh, you have a lot of other benefits like to the soil and all this other stuff. But the uh, fulvic acid, I can mix things. I can mix that yeah. high the calcium. Mix, the mixability is so much the easier. The foliar uptake. Yes. You're literally chelating the nutrients. So it's, it's just like buying a chelated fertilizer is going to be 10 times more efficient than zinc sulfate salt. And uh, similar. Now, you're not, you don't have a fertilizer factory, so don't expect 10 times the efficiency. Yeah. But you're making the same steps. Yeah. Uh, from a simple thing that everyone's doing, and uh, I like it too for the nitrogen, is AMS. Okay. You yep. know, so depending on what's in the water making it dirty, you know, AMS is a way to add nitrogen and condition the tank to make the herbicides work better. Yeah. Something like that's yeah. very helpful. Well, and even like in our areas, I mean, AMS, and there's acidifiers on the market for the spray tank too. Yeah, citric you know. acid with fulvic. Guys, if you've liked the information that you've seen so far, go ahead and check out the full-length podcast on our YouTube channel. Be sure to subscribe there. It's also on all the major plat- podcast platforms. Um, we're constantly dropping info and more content on all the social media platforms, TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, etc. Check it out for a lot more content.